Brian, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, super excited to talk about this. We've been chatting about this, I feel like, for, for years and years. And so now I'm just super excited that we can actually share this discussion with uh, so many more people, infinitely more people on LinkedIn. Um, so for those that don't know Brian, sales leader at IBM, uh, he and I met almost nine years ago uh, and been very close friends ever since then. We started a company together uh, and I've followed his, his path with great interest uh, as he's gone from startup to late stage company, built sales teams, uh, exceeded revenue targets, done everything that you would expect from a sales leader. And as we've moved into uh, this recruiting process uh, and the operational an uh, and analytical side of things, uh, he and I have been discussing a lot around what makes a good hire? How do you think about the recruiting process from the hiring manager side? And actually, how do you build great teams? So uh, super excited about this topic. Um, before we kick in, Brian, do you want to give a quick two minute overview and tell us why this topic is so important to you? Yeah, pleasure to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me, man. Um, so it, my background, I think you summed up summed up nicely. So after after the military and business school, I got into sales because I didn't know how to sell. And ultimately, the fate of the startup that Chris and I had made uh, fell into not having any customers. So I wanted to plug the gap and have since um, done every, every job on the sales floor. I've run global customer success teams, global account management teams, and I'm now running a uh, about 100 person global sales team with uh, with IBM in our, our automation portfolio. Um, so a, a little bit of everything and like the crux of all of that is hiring great people. Great teams are built by great people and uh, the cost of a bad sales hire is directly proportional to quota attainment. Um, so this is a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. That's awesome. So you've already started on the first topic, the quota and for sales teams, that's so important. You get the right hires in place, you're gonna meet exceed quota. Um, so what happens if you if you don't get the right hires in place? What have you seen? What are the risks of doing that? Uh, I mean, everything from, it's just gonna take that much longer for someone to come up to speed to you lose deals and you don't hit your number and you have to make up for it on other reps, other deals. Um, you know, I, I never like to think about people as, as resources. They are like the biggest assets that we have and really the only asset that you have in a sales organization. But at the end of the day, like if every seller is expected to carry a million dollar quota and one seller doesn't come close to hitting a million dollars, like you have to find a way to make it up. Um, which in some organizations is easier than others. Making it up usually means that you're paying accelerators out to other sellers, which is great, but is going to impact your, your bottom line, your cost of sale. Um, and it means that you just have this, this gap. Ultimately, as a sales leader, you can do all the right things, and it doesn't matter if you don't hit your number. Like That is the single most important thing. And anytime you go into a job interview or you meet with a board, your performance in, or your expected future performance is going to be based off of how well did you hit your number in the past? Everybody on your team is a key factor in that. And putting the right team in place is ultimately the, uh, in my mind, the number one goal and the number one attribute of a sales leader. Got it. So arguably sales is one of the if not the most metrics driven function in an organization and you've got to hit that number if you don't have the right people and and they don't share the workload then someone's got to pick up the slack or it's on you as the sales leader to take the hit on why you didn't hit that quota so what about the impact to the team so you, you talked a little bit about you know you've got to pick up the slack elsewhere what would you say the impact is on that the impact to morale, the impact to overall productivity, retention, like, and, and where does the role of the sales leader fit into maintaining that? It's, it's enormous. It's enormous. Um, great teams are things that are kind of self-fulfilling. Great people make other great people better. Um, and it is a positive feedback loop. Um, tolerating mediocrity 
when you're trying to build a culture of a players is toxic to everything that you stand for and ultimately the culture that you're trying to establish. Um, so like the, the old saying, higher, fast, fire, faster, like applies, but like you don't always have that option. And, you know, it's been a very big disparity going from small companies to big companies in my career too, um, where like sometimes you just don't have that option, which makes getting the higher right off the bat that much more important and that much more crucial. Agreed. And you, know, you, you talk about tolerating mediocrity. There used to be a saying uh, in the Navy that everyone wants an above average performer, but half of the people are below average. So, uh, you know, when you think about statistics, statistics like that, how do you think about like, what makes a, a good sales rep? When you're thinking about, you know, the, the top quartile, the top 10% of sales reps, what do you think are the core traits that make someone successful? And are they different when you look at early stage versus growth, late stage versus, you know, IBM? I don't think, I think a great sales hire is a great sales hire period. Um, I do think that there's probably a slightly different profile if you're looking at an enterprise seller versus a velocity inside seller versus an account manager versus a customer success manager. Like the level of input that that or like is empathy that that person has toward relationship building fundamentally changes as you change job roles in, uh, in the sales organization. But when it comes to size, like I don't think it, it particularly matters. Like I think at the end of the day, you need someone that is hungry, curious, somebody who's incredibly growth minded and wants to learn. They want to learn the product set. They want to learn about the customer. They want to ultimately solve problems for people. And they recognize that they're not going to solve problems until they deeply understand problems. Um, I do think that intelligence and empathy are incredibly important. You have to have a relatively high EQ to be a successful salesperson, or at least be very aware of, uh, of how you're emotionally affecting those around you. Um, and then like, I think the biggest other thing is, is like ownership. Um, I've worked with a lot of sales reps in my career that sit back and you know, they'll, they'll wave their hands and point like, oh, well, it's marketing. I'm not getting enough leads and getting the wrong leads. At the end of the day, like we have an obligation and we have a number to hit and it is a find a way or make one mentality going back to my, uh, my, my days at Black Duck and shout out to Adam Clay. Um, it is on us. Like no one's going to come in and save us. We need to work as a team, but we need to take ownership for what's working and what's not and quickly identify what those root causes are and make changes. Um, so you have to be incredibly introspective as a, as a person to be an effective sales rep. And like notice with, with none of that, I did not say someone who has repeatedly hit targets. I did not say someone who has been in sales for, 10 years or 15 years or someone who has sold the same product set in the same industry. Like that is, I think all completely independent. That stuff can be taught. That should be taught by a company. You need to find the right person who has the right core personality skills more than the right product expertise or industry expertise. And that's, that's an amazing segue into really, I think, the crux of what we're discussing. And we actually didn't rehearse this beforehand, although it sounds like we did. Uh, so you talked a lot, of, a lot there about the traits that make up a really good sales rep or sales leader. Yeah. Um, and pretty much exclusively soft skills we're talking about here. These are things that you could maybe write about yourself in a cover letter or maybe learn from a referral or a recommendation on LinkedIn. But really, it's not until you, you actually understand how that person works uh, which is Im impossible to do before you've actually spent time with them. So what, what I would really love to do is actually go through the whole recruiting cycle with you and then try and understand from your perspective, what are the different markers of those soft skills, of those potential 
post higher performance signals that you can pick up from each stage. Yeah. And if you were recommending a sales leader take on this approach right now, how would you actually turn those into actionable steps for them? Um, so if that's all right with you, we're, go we're going to kick off with sure thing. the very first stage of the process. So we've already defined what a good sales rep looks like. You, you develop those, those kind of soft skills, those competencies, those traits, and you've highlighted that I don't really care so much about the quota, whether they hit target, whether they were um, uh, uh, skilled in certain technical aspects of the job, essentially anything that can be learned or developed, uh, the sales leader could actually take on as a responsibility. It's the kind of core trait. So um, as you're kicking off a new search for a sales team, you're going to be presented with hundreds, if not thousands of resume profile reviews, uh, you're going to be joining that process yourself. How do you think about assessing someone before you even have the chance to talk to them? I will admit, like I've fall, fallen into the trap before of, hey, I'd like to see someone in this industry who has some kind of experience, relevant experience. Like it's bias, it's pattern matching. But at the end of the day, like the thought is if you can find the right person in that kind of in that firmography, they're going to, they're going to ramp faster. There's less that you have to teach them. They're already aware of the background and all you have to teach them that is the product and your, your process. Um, so like for a, a salesperson and, and it kind of depends on, again, which piece of the organization you're hiring into, uh, if I'm hiring an enterprise rep, like I'm going to want to see some past record of success with at least mid-sized companies that have some track record or some experience selling into and winning deals in and around my price point. Um, I kind of think about the market in two flavors. Like there's people that have experience selling to business people and people who have experience selling to technical people. You can cross over one to the other, but the technical skill set is much harder to get. Selling into a CFO or a COO is fundamentally different than selling into the CTO organization or the CIO organization. Um, and when you're trying to think about how do I ramp people faster, like understanding core technologies and having general familiarity with an industry may help. So that would be a starting point for a search. And it has been often where I've started my searches with my, my TA leads. But then I would say like it really comes down to having a good rapport with the recruiter who understands these core attributes that you're looking for and can learn to suss them out in just like a 15 minute screener call. call like questions like, hey, like, what was it about this position that interested you? Um, why would you make a change? And like those are questions that tend toward a whole lot of bullshitting. Can I, can I say that live? Yeah, you can say what you like. <laughs> and like when you've spoken to enough candidates, like you learn to recognize like, okay, who, who is offering a very genuine look at why they're open to a new opportunity, at why they are uh, looking to grow their career or move in a different direction. And some of them will just say like, oh yeah, you know, like, always open for something with more money. Well, like if you had a reasonable pipeline, if you were good at your job, then like you probably wouldn't be looking. Caveat to that is if like they're coming from a company that's terrible and doesn't have a good product and you know that, then like that's that's also like something to consider. Um, so that, that screening process to me is all about like validity of kind of some core personality traits and then some core hard skills and recognizing then going into the first interview with the hiring manager, like, okay, is there, is there enough here? Like, it is not full qualification. It's initial qualification. And then in the hiring manager interview, how I've always liked to start off is what do you know about my company? What do you know about this role? What questions do you have for me? And then kind of walk through the resume um, in backwards order which is kind of ironic because I always tell my resume in forwards order, like the how I got to now version, but I'll walk through backwards. Like, tell me about this position. 
why did you take the job? Why did you leave the job? What did you learn? Okay, the one before that. Why did you take the job? Why did you leave the job? What did you learn? And in that, you can begin to kind of assess a, an understanding for that person's motivation and growth mindset. And I would say like those are the two kind of underlying things that like no matter what, you can't teach that. So if someone's hungry, they're going to be looking to grow personally, professionally, and financially. And those are all real reasons to leave a job and take another one. If someone looks back at an experience and is like, oh man, yeah, you know, I can't really tell you what I learned there. Like, it's not who you want. Um, and the more raw and honest with you they are, the more I tend to like them. Okay, so I picked up on a lot of the things that you actually kicked off with, with the empathy relationship with the, the, the customer ultimately. And it sounds like you really value the relationships you build with your recruiting team and enable them to understand exactly what you're looking for. So has the has this candidate actually had experience selling to the people that we're going to be selling to? Uh, and I think reading between the lines, it sounded like the domain specific experience is less relevant than the ability to actually make those personal connections. So that's one of the things that you're looking for very early on to qualify potential candidates out that are not going to be a good fit. Yeah. And then you're, you're actually... So go, go ahead. So, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And then you're, as you're moving candidates through this early stage of the funnel, you're really trying to understand their motivation. It's not about what did you do? It's about why did you do, would you do this? What did you learn? Can you be introspective about the experiences you had? Even if you never hit quota, why was that? What did you learn? Can you actually be, be, be coached and trained? And these are some of the signals that you're picking up before you even start bringing people in to onsite interviews. Yes. Yes. Um, and like with that, like there's a hundred different reasons why someone might hit quota. And a lot of them are legitimate, especially if they've spent their time in early stage companies that are looking for product market fit. Like you can look all you want. If the product doesn't keep up with the needs in the market, then like you're, you're automatically as, at a disadvantage as a seller. If the financial analysis is wrong and quotas are set ridiculously and grow 500% year over year without the right support in place to do it and the right lead flow to support that. And like that seller is playing from behind. So like those are, there are legitimate things there and someone can take that either as, Hey, I am the victim of this, or they could say, I am the, uh, I learned a lot from that experience. Ultimately I, I did everything within my power and it was, it was not enough, but here's what I learned about it. And that to me is a sign of a high potential performer who may have just had some bad luck or was put in a really raw spot. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm rambling a little now. No, that, that was, that was perfect. And actually I'd just like to, to drill into that just for a, a, a little bit deeper. Uh, so there are a lot of sales reps actually in that situation right now where they've worked at early stage companies, they've taken a risk, but, in the last 12 months, we've seen all the layoffs across early stage tech. And now these reps didn't hit quota, potentially been unemployed for, for a couple of months. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming from a, you know, a, a less well-known company, it sounds like in your opinion, that's less of a, of a concern, but for them, is there any, any advice that you could give them to make sure they get a fair shot when they're going to, to the top of the funnel? Uh, of this kind of recruiting process. Yeah, I really like, don't, but I think attack it head on. Um, be honest and introspective about it. And like in any situation, there's always going to be external factors, but there's always going to be something that you can, could have done better. Um, and if you're not, if you don't have the uh, internal drive or introspective capabilities to like properly assess your your weaknesses there and say like hey this is what i'm going to do better next time then like then you're just a victim and like victims don't do well in sales um so i would really just encourage people to dive deep be honest be a little vulnerable about it and just put it all out there. Hey, this is what happened. This was within my control. This is what outside of my control. Here's what I learned. And here's how 
I'm going to change my behavior or control things moving forward and how this, I won't make the same mistake twice. Um, that is the story that I would want to hear from a, a top performer that fell, fell on bad luck. Got it. So going back to a lot of things you, you said earlier, be raw, be honest. Don't blame others. Take ownership of what was within your control, but be introspective about what you couldn't control. And don't make excuses, but just just uh, figure out how you've learned from from those experiences. I think that's that's a really awesome takeaway. Um, and let's go back to the uh, to the recruiting process now. Let's think about the next stage of the funnel. So we screen people. We've got some really good potential candidates coming through. Now we move generally to a to a, an on site interview panel, and I can very depending on the type of company, but um, you can go a little bit deeper when you're trying to assess potential candidates here. What are some of the things that you would now want to look at and what are maybe some of the tools or approaches that you found to be successful when you're trying to determine whether someone can actually do the job once you actually get them to that final stage? I'll, I'll, I'll start off with tools and I've only used one that I found to be incredibly helpful and it's, it's called predictive index. And it's a very easy personality survey that can be used to assess someone's natural personality and inclinations on four dimensions. And like, once you learn to read that as a manager, it's not that someone is pre-wired into a pattern or that there is only one good pattern to, to fit that role. Like what you'll find is like, if someone in that test comes off as a natural people pleaser, then that is uh, likely at odds with them driving urgency and getting the transaction done. So then I would ask questions very intentionally around urgency and driving transactions over just building relationships. Because at the end of the day, like we're here to get things across the line. Um, and I would see if they can overcome that. And it's again, not that they're unable or unwilling to operate on a different vector, it's that they're probably just pre-wired to one. Like ironically, I'm the other way. I tend to be more transactional than I am a relationship builder. But then as a manager, if I can suss that out, like, okay, so they they are pre-wired a certain way. I'm going to ask them questions to see if they can overcome that. But then I also know that this is just something to keep an eye on and likely where I may have to have more managerial oversight or input to drive that urgency. Um how that played out on like a, a customer success team that I hired, for instance, like I needed people that would build relationships. And I would look at that assessment and say, okay, like these people are naturally inclined to build relationships. That's great. I'm the opposite. So I can drive them to get transactions done, but they're going to be the one maintaining the relationship with the customer on the ground which I cared more about than me retaining that relationship with the customers on the ground. So it created a really nice balance there that was highly effective where my skill set and their skill sets were, were uh, opposite, but, but balanced. Um, so I can't understate like how well PI helps with the hiring process. They also have another assessment that I've only used a couple of times. It's an intelligent intelligence measurement like you can put a highly intelligent person into a black box and they're going to figure out how to do something. You can take a person with below average intelligence and put them in that black box and they're not going to get anything done. So like hiring smart people does matter in sales. Um, so that is not, that test is not all inclusive. It is not, not a, you must fit this mold. It's directional and helps inform me where I need to press for how that person might be naturally inclined or otherwise disinclined as it compares to the needs of the job. Um, so predictive index is probably the only, the only tool that I've ever used that I would recommend uh, in terms of process for me, it's then beginning to get an understanding of both the, the deeper person behind the candidate. Um, but also like, what are these, I'm not even calling them gaps. Like what are the natural inclinations? Um, maybe they're really biased to action and they're an excellent prospector, but they don't have a whole lot of legitimate closing experience. Okay, great. 
what would I need to do to mitigate that risk as a manager? Is that worth my time investment or is there a better candidate that has more of like the, the full skill set already built out and proven that I need that would slot in better? Um, I would usually have a candidate meet with three or four people and have everybody generally aligned to getting a slightly different view on things. One person may dig into uh, sales history. Another person may try to do a role play with them. When I do that, I like to do that unannounced. I like that to be like intentionally uncomfortable uh, to see how the person reacts to an unexpected sales role play. I would expect that if the person is coming into a second round, uh, they are caught up on the company and the product. So I would begin to test their knowledge on how much research did you do? How prepared are you? Do you actually want this job or are you just fishing? And then I like to leave a lot of room for them to ask questions of me. The questions that they ask of me, I find always to be the most illuminating part of their character. Like what are their concerns? What have they identified? And if those concerns are like, Hey, how do you stack up to your competition with this? Because I'm seeing that this one company is really dominant in the sector. So like, what specifically are you doing to take them out? How are you winning against them? Like that to me is a really insightful question. That's a rep coming in already thinking, how do I make my number? Um, questions like how many of your reps hit last year? Like also a really good question because they're thinking about how they're going to hit their number. Um, general research on the, the background and the technologies that you cover and questions of like how that fits in with other things that they may or may not know. And when I ask questions of them, I will purposely pull it down to try to find the extent of their knowledge to the point that they become uncomfortable. And one of two things either what will happen. They're either going to say like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like you, you got me there. That's the extent of my knowledge. Or they're going to try to fake their way through it, which tells me something about their character. I want someone to say, no, like you got me to the end. I did a bunch of research, but that's, that's as far as I can go right now. I, I want that level of transparency because if they're not going to, if they're going to try to bullshit you, they're going to try to bullshit a customer. And that is not the face of the company of any company that I want to be responsible for. So I would rather a rep go into a customer and say like, you got me. I don't know. I'll come back to you and then have the honor and integrity to go back to that. And that can be sussed out in the interview process. That's a, a amazingly clear picture. It sounds like if I could summarize it into, into two areas, there's kind of like a, a test that you're trying to do to understand if we hire this person, where do I as a leader need to lean in and help to make them successful? But then there's also a test of how intrinsically motivated is this person? How much background research did they do? How are they actually going to respond when they're put in front of a customer and, and, um, and will they be able, be able to hit their number? And so there's things that you can, you can train and coach for, there's things that you can't train and coach for, and you're really trying to identify them throughout that final stage of, of the interview process. And it sounds like PI has been a good tool to actually help direct some of those questions as you get someone into that final round of interview. Uh, but it really takes introspection from the manager and the sales leader to actually understand what weaknesses they have as they're trying to build their team out as well. So I think that was a, a really great summary. Uh, so, and, and really just to wrap up, uh, Brian, I know you've been building out some teams at IBM. Um, I'll give you a, a minute or so to talk about any opportunities that you see coming up in the near future, if anyone wants to work with you or where people can learn more about the work that you're doing. Man, you know, and unfortunately we uh, we're relatively full, full staffed right now. Um, so I don't have open roles to advertise on, on my team at the minute. Uh, I'm available on, on LinkedIn and happy to connect with, with folks who are looking to either expand their network or, or learn more. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably my primary, primary mechanism, Chris. Amazing. Brian, I've learned a ton. Thanks so much for going into depth with, with, with me on this. You got it, man. My pleasure.